Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, I'm Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, joining you here this evening. Uh, glad to be back. Um, I said glad to be back as if I wasn't here last week. I guess I've been gone so much this month that I'm still kind of reorienting myself to the like regular world here. But we're back. Um, so, um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. Tonight is an exciting night because we are going to at least approach the uh, poem, uh, which I'm super excited about, not only because I'm always super excited about the poetry, but also because this is my favorite poem uh, in The Lord of the Rings. Well, not just The Lord of the Rings. I have to say, this is my favorite poem that Tolkien ever wrote. I love this poem. Um, if I had to choose all of the... Now, JJ, the troll song is fun. I love singing the troll song and it's a great time. But yes, yes, this poem, uh, this poem is my favorite. I love the errantry poem. That's another, you know, big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, favorite of mine. But I do have to say uh, this, uh, this poem, which I always uh, think of as light as leaf on linden tree, which was the original title of it. Um, but the, the song of Tenuvio, as, as Aragorn calls it, um, this is, uh, this is really the uh, the big deal here. So, um, okay. But first, as usual, uh, I have a, a couple uh, questions. For actually, just one. Just one question. Um, yes, tonight's topic is what to do when the darkness presses round. That, of course, is what Sam is going to say uh, in, in talking to Aragorn. And... Um, um, we will uh, we will see uh, we will see what to do when the darkness presses round. Um, first question. This is from uh, Beach Number Twenty Seven, which is exciting because I think this uh, is actually from one of the trees in the old forest, Number Twenty Seven of the Beaches, apparently, which is exciting to hear from them. Um, and glad they're still with us after our discussion of the old forest. Um, okay, so uh, the Twenty Seventh Beach says in the last exploring episode there was discussion about the balance Aragorn strikes between uh, encouraging the hobbits yet keeping them grounded and aware of the very real danger they're threatened by. So even after he finds the notched white stone sitting on a pile of scorched rock, he does not declare. And thus Gandalf clearly drove his enemies away and escaped. I suspect we shall see him again or anything of that sort. He just concludes or says that he concludes that the scorecard for this fight is beyond his reading. While I think it's true that Aragorn doesn't want to buoy the hobbits with false hope, since that leads to easy deflation, and he knows that Gandalf may be attacked again and again and again before reaching safety, I think there's something else going on here. Not quite foreshadowing exactly, but a hint that one may drive the wraiths to retreat and yet not win. Uh, and then here I had to skip a bit. Uh, the 27th Beach, who was not hasty uh, in writing this post, um, uh, said... Um, uh, is, there, is there a problem with the Twitch stream? Hang on a second. It was citing uh, evidence that Aragorn is familiar with the ringwraiths and, and like what they do, and uh, specifically how he seems unsurprised to see the weapon and can identify it and stuff. So uh, familiarity with the weapon. Um, okay, all right. Twitch stream up. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, anyway, so then goes on to say, I would suggest that he knew it was possible that Gandalf was faced with a Morgul blade, and if he was faced with such a blade, that it could be that he was pierced by it, and if he was pierced by it, it could be that Aragorn's mind is resurrecting Tolkien's old Wizard King title uh, for the Witch King, uh, or at least wondering if such a blade would be more or less effective against Gandalf. At the very least, I suspect a first-time reader would notice Aragorn's reluctance to declare Gandalf the winner, despite almost certainly placing the stone after the fight itself and have and have that uh, add to the sense of dread. Our walking party may not be able to drive the wraiths off, um, but even if they can, it might not be good enough. And then said reader sees all too soon how cold a comfort victory can be. I think that's, this is a really neat observation. So basically... The argument here is not that Strider is just being sort of strangely diffident, right? The point is not that Strider is simply, for some reason, being like, well, I can, why, you know, don't quote me on whether or not Gandalf survived, right? That's not the point. The point is um, that he knows that even though Gandalf obviously did escape and did drive the ring wraiths away, that doesn't mean, not only does it not mean he's won permanently, but it doesn't mean that he's necessarily even 
uh, escaped long term, right? That uh, the Strider being familiar with the um, uh, with the weapons of the enemy could know that Gandalf might have been able to escape and yet still uh, be at risk, uh, right, in the future. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and and, and I, I was particularly struck uh, by that that note at the end, right? Thinking about a, a first time reader, right? If you really stop and think about it and listen to what Aragorn is saying, right? Yes, Gandalf. I mean, because the, the the conclusion that Gandalf drove off the Black Riders seems fairly clear, right? And yet, so why is it? Why is it that Arag- that Aragorn would not be like? So obviously he won, right? Um, it just seems sort of like madly overcautious to to not draw that conclusion, right? I mean, that conclusion's obvious. So it just the the very lack of information that he gives there, right, would would sort of lead you to suspect that he um he knows something or is worrying about something else. Like, okay, again, yes, Gandalf drove them away, but that's not necessarily the whole story, right? Even though he drove them away something else could have happened, right? Or some other, so, you know, in, in other words, setting up for um, what is in fact going to happen in just a few hours from now, right? Um, and I think that's really interesting. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm 100% um, convinced of, uh, uh, of this reading, but I like it. Um, and I think certainly it, at the very least, opens up this kind of new... Uh, uh, thought about, you know, new, uh, uh, new possibilities for, um, the, uh, reasons for Aragorn's reluctance here, why he's so cautious. Cause he knows, you know, when you're fighting the ring wraiths, it's not just necessarily a binary question, right? It's not just, did you win? Yes or no. You know, did you, um, uh, uh, it, it's more complicated than that, and the the weapons of the enemy are more insidious than that, um, and I think that that's really really interesting. So, um, so cool. I think that that's uh, that's a really interesting perspective, and I'm really grateful uh, to the 27th Beach uh, for pointing that out. Now let's return to Weathertop. Down in the lowest and most sheltered corner of the dell, they lit a fire and prepared a meal. The shades of evening began to fall, and it grew cold. They were suddenly aware of a great hunger, for they had not eaten anything since breakfast, but they dared not make more than a frugal supper. The lands ahead were empty of all save birds and beasts, unfriendly places deserted by all the races of the world. Rangers passed at times beyond the hills, but they were few and did not stay. Other wanderers were rare and of evil sort. Trolls might stray down at times out of the northern valleys of the Misty Mountains, Only on the road would travelers be found, most often dwarves, hurrying along on business of their own, and with no help and few words to spare for strangers. "'I don't see how our food can be made to last,' said Frodo. "'We have been careful enough in the last few days, and this supper is no feast. But we have used more than we ought if we still have two weeks to go, and perhaps more.' "'There is food in the wild,' said Strider, "'berry, root, and herb, and I have some skill as a hunter at need.' You need not be afraid of starving before winter comes, but gathering and catching food is long and weary work, and we need haste. So tighten your belts and think with hope of the tables of Elrond's house. Okay, first of all, the whole the general um, atmosphere of that first paragraph um, is, I have to say, the th- it's impossible for me. You know, not e- even briefly to remember the parallel scene in the movie, right? Which is the one, of course, when like Mary Pippin and Sam are cheerfully, you know, doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, tomatoes and nice crispy bacon, uh, right? Uh, before Frodo puts out their fire, <clears throat> and um, the the biggest, I mean. I don't know, I'm kind of torn, right? On the one hand, that's one of the scenes that people often point to, and you can see that they're capturing something there, like they're capturing the sort of the resiliency of the hobbits, and even under these circumstances and in these envir- in this environment, which in the film is made to look suitably creepy, um, even though Weathertop isn't all that high, but whatever, it's fine. Um, they, uh, nevertheless, like, you know, hear the hobbits cheerfully, you know, cooking food. And so, you know, you can you can 
I can get that, right? That that sense of the resilience of, of the Hobbit's attitude is an important part of Hobbit character and Hobbit personality. But what it does is it loses the entire atmosphere of this entire scene, right? Um, you know, the lands ahead were empty of all save birds and beasts, unfriendly places deserted by all the races of the world. Um, this sense of sort of huddling and 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 fear, not just of the circumstances, right? Their, their great sense of their loneliness and exposure here, right? Even that sense almost of trespassing. They, the hobbits have gone way beyond, as we've already discussed, you know, way beyond the boundaries of their normal uh, radius, right? Sam has the smallest radius and, and crossed his radius fairly early on in the, uh, in, the, in, in the process. But even, of course, remember, by going east of Bree, they've passed the bounds of almost all hobbits, right? Very, 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 you know, very few, maybe arguably, possibly one hobbit um, uh, in the Shire has gone east of Bree in, in a couple of generations for all we know. Um, so it's kind of a big deal, right? And that sense of trespassing, of going off into the Lone Lands, as they're called in The Hobbit, um, but of course, it's more than just this is more than just purely the psychological um, the psychological effect, right, of feeling like they're far away from home. You have that on top of that, the sort of oppressive and ominous sense of the surroundings, right? That like the place that you're in is a band like like nobody comes here and there's a reason nobody comes here, right? Um and that in that sense, you're trespassing, not trespassing in the sense of crossing into somebody else's territory, but going somewhere that everybody but you knows better than to go. Right. Is sort of the sense that they that they seem to have here. Um, uh, yeah. And for Thoughtless, I, I, I do agree that uh, the first paragraph does kind of recall Bilbo's adventures uh, with the trolls. Right. Uh, we do. We do. We should remember that. Um, the concern about food. Um, now, it's not pouring rain here, uh, you know, and the drip, drip, drip was very annoying. Uh, you know, so we get that really miserable wet night where they can't even light a fire and everything. That's the setup for the troll adventure specifically. But um, but I agree. That sense of, of you know, hunger and concern and uh, cheerlessness and everything. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's... Uh, that's that is parallel i agree um yeah good okay so um the perspective of that next paragraph that second paragraph um is interesting interesting in that you know we're kind of being um you know we're being informed of you know how um how things really are uh, that second paragraph sounds really editorial right um uh rangers passed at times beyond the hills like notice they you know they're not exactly they're not being told this they're not um uh you know, so Strider isn't saying this they're not asking about this the narrator is just informing us of this fact right other wanderers were rare and of evil sort. Trolls might stray down. Only on the road would travelers be found. Um, this is definitely a, this is definitely a, an after the fact kind of explanation, right? Um, by the way, uh, I, I had a question about um, the road. Right. Um, who made the road, and what is the road? Of course, one is tempted to say that it could be a leftover uh, Arnorian road. Um, but the best explanation we get is that it's, it's called the Dwarf Road uh, on some occasions, and that seems likely, uh, that the dwarves were the ones um, to make it. Uh, and which makes sense because although you know we tend to think of the dwarves exclusively as craftsmen, um, we, uh, we instead... Uh, you know, learn fairly early on that the dwarves are traders. They are merchants as well. Indeed, the, in the early days, um, you know, when uh, uh, Tolkien first put dwarves into the Silmarillion material, they were almost exclusively merchants. They were merchants far more than they were craftsmen. Uh, their relationship with smithcraft grew over time. Um, 
but uh, uh, but anyway, they they were always uh, they were always merchants uh, as well. Um, I well. Gilgon theory it would be uh, it would be the main commuter route. I mean, the dwarves are, you know, and, and because of being merchants, the dwarves are one of the only peoples who travel about enough, right? Back in the old days, the Gondorian, you know, the, the you know Gondor and Arnor did. That's where the Greenway comes from, right? The Greenway is the main road between our Ar- Arnor and Gondor, though it's you know fallen into disrepair. Um, but the east-west road, that's the dwarf road, right? Because the dwarves are the ones going from one set of mountains to the other, uh, primarily. Um, the elves don't build roads like that. At least we don't see any elf roads uh, of that kind. Um, and uh, there's no, you know, the Bree folk aren't going to build roads. Um, certainly not all the way through the Shire and out the other side and then off to, you know, it's way outside of their bounds. Uh, we know that the road is not a Hobbit road. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the dwarves are, are pretty much the only ones who are going to be uh, traveling those roads um, for, uh, for that, um, for that kind of distance and in that kind of way. Um, yeah. Um, well, see, trifle. That's interesting. We don't really know exactly where the road leads. Um, uh, trifle was just saying uh, the only problem, I guess, with it being a dwarf road is it's not leading uh, to Casa Doom. Well, yeah, um, we don't know that it doesn't. Uh, in fact, right? Um, they never follow it that far. Um, we don't know, for instance, that it was the dwarf road. Like, if you carry on from Bree, that it takes you right up to the pass that, um, that you know, Bilbo and Gandalf and the dwarves attempted to cross in The Hobbit. We have no idea if that's the case. Um, we might suspect that that's the case, but they were, you know, setting out from Rivendell and finding the right pass over the mountains. It doesn't say that they returned to the dwarf road. Um, the road does lead to the Lonely Mountain and to worse places, says Fourth Dauntless, and Belong's Mond, of course, is very correct, saying that where the road goes is uh, ever on and on, obviously. Um, clearly. Clearly, that's true. Um, but, <laughs> anyway, the point is, we don't really know, because we, we always leave it, right? We know that the, that the, the, the road doesn't um, uh, take you straight to Rivendell, right? It does go straight to the, to the, to the, to the ford of, of Bruinen, right? We don't know exactly where it ends up after that. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it's really it's really hard to say as far as kind of reconstructing the old dwarf road. And also, it wouldn't surprise me a bit, um, uh, a trifle, if even back in the heyday of Casa Doom, they didn't have the road just going straight up to the gates. Because uh, remember those gates, the, uh, the 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 west gate, that's the Holland Gate, right? That gate was. It's not like that's the main door of Moria necessarily. Um, it's the main entrance because that was the place where they had most. You know, they 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 built that door because it was right there at Aregion, right? So that they could hang out with their uh, close neighbors uh, and friends, the Noldor of Aregion. Celebrimbor and, and, and company, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they would route the trading route from uh, from like the Blue Mountains all the way down through Oregion in order to come in the Holland Gate, right? They could well have had a, another place uh, where it went into the mountains and then by then, thence by underground paths um, down into the main halls of Casa Doom. Nothing seems more likely to me than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, uh, yeah, yeah. I agree that the maps, uh, the, the maps have the East West road looking like it picks up on the other side of the high pass. Yeah, I agree. But is it still the dwarf road at that point? Um, notice there's no dwarf road on the other side. The dwarves aren't following a dwarf road on the other side. Um, there's the old road, but that seems to go down into, it's not even clear where that goes anymore down there. Right. So, um, I don't really, uh, I'm not really sure 
what happened on the other side of the mountains as far as the dwarf road is concerned. All we know is that that stretch of road, you know, the, the east-west road that goes through the Shire, um, you know, there in the middle of Eriador is called the dwarf road. So, um, uh, yeah, Rinrus, I agree. I think that the, the dwarves would uh, not have relied exclusively on above-ground roads. It makes a lot of sense to me that they would make those sort of as short as possible and then, you know cut south through the mountains essentially i don't know um but um anyway okay uh let's uh let's keep going wait yeah okay strider reassuring them you need not be afraid of starving um get notice how um how gentle, again, Strider is here, right? Um, you need not be afraid of... So they're kind of... They're concerned about um, a couple things, right? They're concerned about whether their food is going to last. This is the concern that Frodo is expressing right here. And Strider rather gently says... Well, let's not worry so much about starving to death, because long before we have the opportunity to starve to death, we are likely to be captured by the ring rates, right? Which would be sort of a puddle glum co comfort there, um, uh, you know, about like saving funeral expenses and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so he, he, you know, Strider says, OK, no, look, we, we won't starve, right? Um but gathering and catching food is long and weary work, and we need haste, right? But again, he's very indirect there. We need haste. Um, let's not forget. We, we still kind of have to run like people are chasing us, right? If we spend all of our time uh, foraging, uh, we are very much more likely to get caught uh, by, uh, you know, the uh, monsters that are chasing us in the darkness. So let's uh, just focus on... on uh, on, on plowing through here, can we? Um, and anyway, so, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, as I say, I think very gentle, right? You know, he's trying to help them to keep perspective. Um, he's reassuring them, but also not just reassuring them. He's not just being like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll be fine, right? I, you know, he is kind of keeping them, you know, helping them to keep in mind all of their dangers, right? And to kind of balance their concern about their dangers. Um, and yet he uh, focuses on hope, right? Um, you know, we uh, 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 tighten your belts and think with hope of the tables of Elrond's house, right? Focus on, don't focus on worry that you're going to starve to death. You probably won't, won't starve to death anyway. Focus on hopeful thoughts of a feast, right? Because that's the way, not only is that the way to help yourself when you're starving and, and on a deadline, but also this is the way to fight the ring rates, right? Not just to, not just to, um, sort of, uh, remember, it's not just about keeping your own spirits up so that you don't give up. It's, it's actually fighting them, right? Um, this is how you deny them their strength, by keeping your hope up. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Karita is wondering how often Aragorn says the word hope in the books. Uh, and if he says the word hope more often than other characters, that would be an interesting word study to do, wouldn't it, Karita? Um, how often is... Uh, is is uh, the dude named Hope uh, the focus of hope and talking about hope? Certainly seems to be interesting here, right? Um, uh, it, that is in this whole evening, right? And and you can see why. Very very directly related uh, to the uh, predicament that they're in, right? Um, okay. The cold increased as darkness came on. Peering out from the edge of the dell, they could see nothing but a grey land, now vanishing quickly into shadow. The sky above had cleared again, and was slowly filled with twinkling stars. 
Frodo and his companions huddled round the fire, wrapped in every garment and blanket they possessed. But Strider was content with a single cloak, and sat a little apart, drawing thoughtfully at his pipe. As night fell and the light of the fire began to shine out brightly, he began to tell them tales to keep their minds from fear. He knew many histories and legends of long ago, of elves and men and the good and evil deeds of the elder days. They wondered how old he was and where he had learned all this lore. Um, the cold in the darkness, uh, of course, it's uh, hard for me not to remember the comments that uh, Strider just made about uh, the 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 ringwraith smelling the blood of living creatures, right? Uh, and the way in which the, this, you know, sort of the, the warmth of their blood and of their life, right? Uh, being sort of, uh, an attraction to the ringwraiths and their coldness, right? We'll see, we, we will see at, on many occasions that coldness is associated with the ringwraiths. Um, for Thoughtless is asking if this is a natural cold. I'm going to guess no, I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, it is October and nights in October can be quite chilly. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think, um, that this need necessarily be a completely, um, a completely supernatural cold snap here. But as I say, um, there's, um, there's a lot of associations, right? Remember when, um, uh, later on, by the Anduin, they they meet the winged Nazgul in the dark, uh, and Gimli speculates as to whether or not it was a Balrog. Before everyone's like, "Dude, no, Balrogs don't have wings. It couldn't have been a Balrog." Um, but remember, Frodo is the one who says, "No, it wasn't a Balrog. It was something colder." Right. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, I, th th there's 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 um, many cold things associated with uh, the ring rates, as we'll see. But, um, you know, does, does that necessarily mean that the, you know, the darkness and the cold are part of the sort of spiritual oppression of the ring rates? I think it's possible. But where are the ring rates right now? What are they doing right now? Um, have they not arrived yet? Um, remember, um, uh, Remember what we learned from the attack on Crick Hollow. What was the uh, the mo of the Ringwraiths? What did the Ringwraiths do? What was what? How, how did the assault at uh, Crick Hollow go? Do you re you recall? Yeah, the spiritual siege, mad violinist. Exactly. Step one, right? Step one is you s surround the house and you stand there, possibly for hours, right? Just soaking the place in you know the fear that you generate to try to try to um uh strengthen yourself um that's um that's how they operate right it would not surprise me even a tiny bit uh to learn you know we're not told exactly um they're not moving in yet right they're not advancing on them i would not be a, the least bit surprised if there were already ring wraiths around the camp right now um as they're, you know, huddling and shivering and Strider is telling them stories. Um, because this already, already they are, um, the spiritual battle is already going on, right? Um, when Strider starts telling them stories, he's not just doing this to pass the time, right? Um, he's telling them tales to keep their minds from fear. Um, and this, in this case, is enormously practical. Enormously practical. This is not just, again, I'm trying to distract you. Um, this is because your fear is the strength of our enemies. And the, 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 the fear that you are experiencing, that is the weapon of our enemies. Um, and yes, Veronica, I would suspect that Aragorn does know that they're there. Um, and is not telling the hobbits that the, that the ring wraiths have already surrounded them. I wouldn't be in the least surprised to discover that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, exactly, Kate. They gather, they infest, they infuse 
the place with the fear of them and then they attack. Yeah. Um, that's exactly, I think, what we're seeing here. Um, and notice the hobbits are marveling at how much he knows. Um, also notice another thing. He is telling them of elves and men and the good and evil deeds of the elder days. In other words, Strider's not telling them only cheerful stories, right? Um, uh, he's, uh, we know their stories of long ago, histories and legends of long ago, um, of elves and men and the good and evil deeds of the elder days. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know which stories exactly he's telling them right now, right? Um, uh, but, uh, I mean, you know, everyone who's read the Silmarillion knows there aren't exactly very many uh, purely cheerful stories <laughs> from the Elder Days, right? Um, uh, it, it, this is not just about, like, let me tell you stories of, of uh, you know unicorns and rainbows right these are not unicorns and rainbows stories that he's that he's telling them here um so one of the things that's going to be interesting to see is what with what kind of tale um does aragorn primarily associate um uh hope right um this sort of counteractive to fear um yeah Mary has a request. Tell us of Gilgalad, said Mary suddenly, when he paused at the end of the story of the elf kingdoms. Do you know any more of that old lay that you spoke of? I do indeed, answered Strider. So also does Frodo, for it concerns us closely. Mary and Pippin looked at Frodo, who was staring into the fire. I love this. Like, Mary and Pippin are like, dude, you're holding out on us? Like, you know, we were all amazed when Sam started singing that. Because, you know, I'd, I'd Strider suggests that it's not just that Frodo knows the story, it suggests that he knows more of the old lay, right? Like, can you recite more of that poem that Sam said he only knew the first few lines of? Um, uh, but Frodo has to disappoint them. I know only the little that Gandalf has told me, said Frodo slowly. Gilgalad is star... Sorry, Gilgalad was the last of the great elf kings of Middle-earth. Gilgalad is starlight in their tongue. With Elendil, the elf friend... He went to the land of... No, said Strider, interrupting. I do not think that tale should be told now with the servants of the enemy at hand. If we win through to the house of Elrond, you may hear it there told in full. Okay, so here we have the second time that Strider has interrupted them, right? Um, third time, technically, right? We saw him object to Frodo saying that he shall become a wraith, right? I hope that the thinning process does not go on indefinitely or I shall become a wraith, right? We saw him get upset when uh, they were talking about Mordor, you know, and going to Mordor, right? I never thought it would come to that. Uh, and Strider saying, don't speak that name so loudly. So this is the third time that he has intervened in order to say, okay, let's not talk about that. And it's, again, right at the the um, the mentioning of he's about to say the word Mordor again when Strider interrupts him um, with Elendil the elf friend he went to the land of stop stop right um, yeah um, now several interesting things here first why doesn't Strider want them to tell this story what's wrong with this story Right? I agree, Kalandar. It does sound like Strider regrets calling on Frodo to tell a story. Thank you, Frodo. Yeah. Um, um, what's wrong with this one? I mean, you'd think, actually, this one would work well, wouldn't it? I mean, okay, yes, there's a high mortality rate among the protagonists of this story, right? Let's tell me the story of Gilgalad and Elendil, which ends with them both dying miserably, right? Um... But they win, right? Like, the servants of Sauron are all around us, closing in, right? Hey, I have an idea. Let's tell the story of the day when Sauron got his butt handed to him, right? Because he gets, I mean, 
Remember, Sauron is defeated on that day. He's not just... This is another thing that they did in the film, which is interesting, but not like in the book, right? Sauron is not victorious, and then there's this, like, you catastrophic upset with Isildur accidentally cutting off all of his fingers, right? Sauron is thrown down. Um, the, the, the text suggests that Isildur loots the ring from his corpse, uh, I mean, you know, he, he cuts the ring off. He does cut the ring off his hand, right? Um, but but this Sauron is dead, right? I mean, he can't really die. He's not exactly mortal, right? But he is overcome. He is thrown down. Isildur has his foot on Sauron's neck when he takes the ring, right? Um, so this is uh, this is a big deal. Um, and you, again, you'd think. That's an awesome story to tell, right? Let's tell about the day when Sauron was overthrown and how, like, the valor of the good guys is can be enough, right? And, like, we can, even though the enemy is very strong, we, you know, the good guys can rise up and overthrow the evil. And that sounds great, doesn't it? Um, why not... Um, why not do that? So, by the way, I think one or two people, and I see uh, particularly uh, uh, people in the talent having a problem with the Twitch channel, refresh your page. Uh, sometimes refreshing the page helps, but it's definitely working now. Um, yeah, so uh, um, anyway, so, okay. So, uh, again, this seems like a good story to talk. Yes, Gilgalad dies, and it's sad. Yes, Elendil dies, and that's sad. Um, but... Uh, you know, and yeah, you know, Anarian gets his brains bashed in a little earlier on in the, in the narrative, but nevertheless, right? It's, um, that's a good story. <laughs> You'd think, right? You'd think that would be a good story. Um, uh, and I don't think it's about, it's tempting to be like, well, wouldn't that just really tick the ring rates off? Like, well, mm, you know, I don't really know about that. Uh, several of you are concerned. Uh, I see Tarlonio and Belongsman both um, uh, suggesting that, of course, that story is the beginning of their current story, right? That you have been doomed uh, uh, to bear the ring because Isildur didn't destroy the ring at the time, right? He claimed it. So, I mean, it, yes, it ends with victory in the sense of Sauron overthrown temporarily, uh, and his ring taken from him by force, which is cool. Uh, but long term, you know, it didn't really pan out, right? Um, uh, that's interesting. Amethorn is suggesting that Aragorn is embarrassed about his ancestor uh, and doesn't want to talk about it. Yeah, uh, maybe. I don't think that can be his primary motivation. But um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, JJ's wondering, is it because victory is achieved through pure power and strength of arms? Uh, so, JJ, are you suggesting um, that... Uh, are you suggesting that the... That might be discouraging just because they know that they can't measure up to Gilgo out in a window, right? I mean, that... I mean, it could be... I mean, I can certainly see how telling this as an as, a, as an encouraging story could could backfire, right? Um, it'd be like, okay, so yeah, this same enemy that we're facing, he was overcome barely. It was super hard, right? But like the two great, you know, the great elvish hero and the great human king, um, you know, compared with which there's no one really left in our world uh, now, you know, I, you know, everyone, it's called the last alliance for a reason, right? We can't possibly measure up to the heroes of old and they barely got the job done, right? You know, the, you, you, you can see that kind of back, backfiring, right? Um, so uh, I, 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 I hear that. I think that that's a legitimate uh, concern. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, Matt, that's a good point. Matt says if they were following the big picture, it's a good story. Um, but of course, Mary specifically wants to heal, hear the story of Gilgalad, who dies, right? So if you yes, if you're just telling the story of Gilgalad, um, um, if you're just telling the story of Gilgalad, then, you know, you should, uh, yeah, that, that one doesn't end well, right? Um, uh, quite, 
quite possibly. Harnuth, I agree. I don't think that we can. Um, I don't think that we can underestimate the fact. You know, we can't avoid the fact. This is the second time that Aragorn has gotten twitchy at the name of Mordor itself. Right. Uh, remember his first comment was don't speak that name so loudly and this was well before they had reason to think that the Nazgul themselves might actually be an earshot um, but um, uh, anyway um, th th that I mean I so I agree it is definitely um, um, it is definitely important uh, to think about the significance of you know, going to the land of Mordor um, is the thing. You know, I wonder... I wonder... Remember Pippin's response, right? Um, about going to Mordor, right? When Sam said, I think we should be, I should be headed that way myself. Um, that's when Strider... And, you know, and Pippin being like, going to Mordor? That's kind of a secret. Remember... At the Council of Elrond, they're trying to keep this fact from the servants of the enemy, right? Um, they are hoping that the servants of the enemy are not going to guess that they're setting out for Mordor. In fact, in fact, that's even part of the hope all the way down to near the very end, right? Um, so maybe we don't tell the story about going to Mordor, Right. Especially lest one of these hobbits blurt out something like that again. Um, especially if Aragorn is thinking that the ring rates might be right nearby. Right. Um, so maybe it's the going to Mordor element of this story that that's a little too on the nose. Right. That Strider doesn't want to. Um, you know, I was saying in my subtitle here, maybe he's having second thoughts about uh, following in Elendil's footsteps. Maybe the th he doesn't want to let on that he is planning to follow in Elendil's footsteps. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, Finn. He's bringing up the fact that they're heading that way, right? Or at least, again, Sam was explicitly. Um, uh, Kyle is wondering uh, why does Aragorn not get upset at Sam for saying Mordor in the lay earlier? Again, I don't think it's a magic name. I don't think it's just that, like, you're going to cause bad things to happen. Um, Strider is primarily emphasizing being overheard. Like, don't say that so loudly. Um, he's worried about spies. Um, he's worried about the things that they're saying getting back to the enemy and to the servants of the enemy. At least that's how he seems to talk there. And I suspect that he's even more concerned about it here because there's reason to think that it's it's quite possible the Nazgul themselves are within earshot. And I think that he knows that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, it's uh, Sam could say it in his song, um, which was fine, because again, first of all, again, he didn't have any reason to think that the ring raids themselves were nearby, but he definitely does not want them to be wandering through hostile territory where there could be spies for all they know, right? Uh, blithely saying in their loud hobbit voices, right? Pippin is not using his inside voice, I think, when he's like, going to Mordor, right? You don't, <laughs> shut up, Pippin, that's a secret for crying out loud, right? We really don't want anybody to know that that's the plan. So, um, uh, anyway, I, I think that I, I, I wonder, I wonder how much that's, um, um, how much that's, uh, a part of it. Um, once we get to the house of Elrond and there are no unfriendly ears, maybe we can, uh, uh, talk about that a little bit more. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So. I don't know if that's the only reason. I mean, again, what he says is, I do, I do not think that tale should be told now with the servants of the enemy at hand. Which, again, kind of sounds to me like we don't want... He, what he expresses here is not, I, I am concerned about the, the like psychological and spiritual impact that this will have on you, right, as listeners to the song. I'm worried about the impact it's going to have on them, I don't want the ringwraiths to be listening to this story. I don't want them to be thinking about, uh, to be put into a general, you know, 
heroes of the free people making desperate trip to Mordor frame of mind, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want that to be uh, first and foremost uh, uh, on their consciousness right now. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about something else. Can we just talk about something else? Um, so, I, yeah, yeah. Um, it, and of course, it is also just possible that he is thinking about the psychological impact. That is, one can easily imagine that having them thinking about them, you know, about entering into Mordor, like let's imaginatively go along with this story where you leave the... Uh, you know, your lands behind and you go into darkness where, like, you're likely to die, right, like Gilgalad did and Elendil did, um, that, uh, you know, not necessarily the thing uh, that, especially because, remember, Pippin and Sam both did make that personal connection with that story earlier on. Right. Sam immediately is like, and here we are following in Gilgalad's footsteps. Right. Um, so that story, because of that earlier discussion, is liable to have a kind of personal resonance with them. Whereas even a depressing story. Right. I mean, even if he were like, hey, I'll tell you the story of Tura and Turabar. Right. They're not going to identify with that to the same extent. I mean, it's a tragic story, um, but that's not necessarily going to put them in the wrong kind of place psychologically speaking, right? Spiritually speaking, um, imagining themselves again, leaving light and life behind going into the land of darkness and being killed there. Um, that's, um, that's not a good place for them to be. Um, just hearing a story of somebody else making really tragic decisions and the enemy winning. And uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> Finn is wondering, is there really a good time to talk about Turin? I, I know, I'm not saying that he necessarily would be. Uh, but yes, and Kate, you're absolutely right. He's, uh, it is ring-oriented, um, the story as, as well, which is, again, kind of dangerous ground to be, uh, uh, to be, to be treading. Um, and again, to be kind of uh, bringing up. Um but again, notice he doesn't say like it's a bad story. He, you know, he says, uh, "If we win through to the house of Elrond, you may hear it there told in full." In fact, notice the parallel. This is the second time he said that. Right? Think about the story in hope. So they're supposed to be hoping for the feasts that they'll get at Reven at Rivendell. Right? Tighten your belts and think of the feasts. You know, think of the the think of Elrond's table. Right? And he says think of hearing the story, right? You'll get a chance to hear the story. If we win through to the house in Elrond, you may hear it there told in full, right? You're going to hear the, the best version of that story, right? Way better than I could tell you now. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, one last thing that I would want to touch on here. We've spoken a little bit about Elf Friend, right? And the way in which elf friendship seems to be kind of a big deal here, right? Um, that is not just here, but in the story as a whole, you know, uh, uh, Frodo being named an elf friend, there being something about Strider that he, you know, feels is, you know, how the way in which he feels fair, right? Even if he looks foul. Um, and we were suspecting at the time that maybe it's the elf friendship thing, like speaking to like that, that, that Frodo is discerning in him. Um, but um, he points out that Elendil's, he says, with Elendil, the elf friend. Um, so he identifies Elendil as the elf friend, which, of course, is not just because of all of the elf friends. He is the famousest of the elf friends. He is doing the same thing. Um, he's doing the same thing that he did with, he said, Gilgoad's name means starlight. Similarly, Elendil's name means elf friend. It's practically a translation of Elendil's name. Um, so that's kind of interesting, right? That Elendil, uh, uh, Frodo is pointing out that Elendil, the great king, um, is the, um, he is the elf friend, right? His name means elf friend. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, kind of a big deal in this context, right? And of course, especially given Aragorn's connection with Elendil, right? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep going. I've been waiting to get to this slide for a long time. I call this slide the most important sentence that Tolkien ever wrote. It's a big statement, but I stand by it. Then tell us some other tale of the old days, begged Sam. A tale about the elves before the fading time. I would dearly like to hear more about elves. The dark seems to press round so close. I will tell you the tale of Tenuviel, said Strider. In brief, for it is a long tale, of which the end is not known. And there are none now except Elrond that remember it aright, as it was told of old. It is a fair tale, though it is sad, as are all the tales of Middle-earth and yet it may lift up your hearts. He was silent for some time, and then he began not to speak, but to chant softly. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the big moment here. Um, the sentence that I call the most important sentence Tolkien ever wrote, the sentence that changed Tolkien's life and the lives of so many of us, uh, is that first sentence of the second paragraph there. I will tell you the tale of Tenuviel. That's it. That's the sentence. Um, and I know that many of you have heard me talk about this, so I won't do it in full detail. Um, I talked about this much more in full um, at, where was I? At Millmoot last year uh, in Iowa. Uh, we I talked about this. And of course, you guys uh, in who did the Return of the Shadow class with me have heard me talk about this. Um, but this is, um, this is a really big deal huge deal. Um, and I don't always, you know, just go back to Tolkien's drafts and things. It doesn't tell you everything about the text, but y this is kind of, this is a big, uh, piece of context here. Um, because this is the moment that I, I say it's the moment that changed Tolkien's entire life. Um, I'll just kind of mention the story, uh, in brief here. When Tolkien wrote The Hobbit, he wrote it as a completely separate little fairy tale. Keep in mind that there is no continuity between The Hobbit and the Silmarillion material, not in, in design. And you can see this. When you look carefully at The Hobbit, you can see, yes, he mentions things which look as if they are references to the Silmarillion, right? But when you look at almost all of them carefully, you see that they're not. Um, they're not at all. Gondolin... You know, the, the 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 story of the fall of Gondolin, it seems like straight out of the Silmarillion, right? The 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 conflict between the dwarves and the wood elves. If you've read the Silmarillion, you feel like you know the story that's being alluded to there, right? Um, uh, there's, you know, several moments like that where it seems Elrond himself, right? Uh, it seems like, OK, he's uh, he's calling up the Silmarillion here. And in a sense, of course, he is. Obviously, I'm not trying to pretend that that's a coincidence, but it's very clear when you look at the details. He was not making them continuous. The references that he makes to these things in The Hobbit are full of contradictions that don't fit the Silmarillion, especially the Silmarillion at the time as it existed at the time he wrote The Hobbit. Right. Um, he says things that are just flatly contradictory um, to give you one. Um, um, one quick example of that. You remember that he sa says that there were people in those days, that is the, d the days that of, of, the, of the Hobbit story, um, there were people in those days who had uh, their ancestors among elves and men and of, the, you know, of, of, of those people, Elrond was chief. Who? There's nobody else! Right? Elrond is, if you read the Silmarillion especially, Elrond is the guy. Like, he is, he doesn't even have a brother at that point. So you can't even talk about, like, oh, well, the Numenorians. The Numenorians didn't exist. It's, it's, they're not there. The, the, the Elros is not invented yet. Um, it's just Elrond, right? So, what is he doing? It seems pretty clear what he's doing when he puts that stuff into the Hobbit. Um, it's, he's recycling. Remember, the Silmarillion is not published, and he already has reason to think the Silmarillion isn't going to get published. Um, he has no reason to think. He's been writing this stuff for 20 years, uh, and he's never gotten any nibbles uh, on getting the, the Silmarillion stuff published. But he loves the stories, right? So he has all this stuff. Um, so he, uh, uh, he, he, he recycles some of it, right? We, this is why, by the way, I am 100% convinced. This is why the Arkenstone looks so much like a Silmaril. 
Um, in fact, even the name Arkenstone is almost exactly like the word that he uses for the Silmarils in the Anglo-Saxon translation of the Quenta Silmarillion, because, of course, Tolkien translated the Silmarillion into Anglo-Saxon, because, of course, he did, right, uh, for fun. Um, anyway, when he did that, he used the word Arkenstana, to, uh, to, you know, which means like holy stone, uh, to, uh, uh, to translate the word Silmaril. Right. So and the description of the Arkenstone is very, very similar to the description of the Silmarils. Um, so, again, all this stuff, he's got all these things that he just chucks into the Hobbit. Right. Because it's fun and he loves it, um, whether it's Beowulf stuff like the thief who creeps in and takes the golden cup from the dragon's lair, uh, leading to problems with the dragon thereafter. Right. Or whether it's stuff from his own stories, his own legendarium, um, the fall of Gondolin and Elrond, the half elven and uh, uh, and the Silmarils and everything else. Right. So he. He, he, he recycles all this stuff. He just throws this stuff in, but he's absolutely not thinking about the Hobbit as being part of the Silmarillion world. Then he sets out to write the sequel, and he's still thinking in the same... Oops, I can hear that I've gone here back to the screen. Um, uh, he, when he sets out to write the sequel and he's doing The Lord of the Rings, he's making it consistent with the Hobbit, which means not uh, consistent with... Um, uh, the, not not in the same world as the Silmarillion. And we can see him beginning to uh, recycle again, right, uh, as he goes along. And initially, when he brings up Gilgalad in the Last Alliance, he's recycling again. Um, uh, and you can still see some differences. It's not consistent with the story as it is written at the time in the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion. Um, so... Uh, anyway, he, he, this is the moment, right? When he gets to this point, um, this kind of comes out of nowhere, uh, in a sense. Um, but he's not done anything like this before. The moment that Strider opens his mouth and says, I will tell you the tale of Tenuvio. That is the first moment when Tolkien takes the barriers down and decides, no, no, this these stories, these legends and myths and, 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 and uh, you know, sagas that I've written, this is the same world. I'm going to make all of this work together and I'm going to, and I'm going to bring them in. Um, and he does. And as we know that, I think that's really what changes everything. The Hobbit's a wonderful story. Um, but if the Lord of the Rings had not, if in writing the Lord of the Rings, he had not made this step, he hadn't decided to take that wall down and say, okay, no, those stories in this world, they are the same, and they're going to uh, to merge together and feed on each other and make this one big story world. Um, if he had not done that, the Lord of the Rings wouldn't be the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and anyway, so I I think that this is this is just it's it's a huge deal, right? For, this is the story that changed his entire storytelling process that enables the Lord of the Rings to become what it's going to become. Uh, so as I say, this is the this is the sentence that changed all of our lives, really. Uh, and uh, I think it's super exciting to see that emerge uh, when you're reading The Return of the Shadow. Um, for those of you who did the, that class with me, remember how excited I got at that point, because I think this is pretty awesome. Um, Elrond is the only one who remembers it aright, as it was told of old, right? Um Yes. You know, um, uh, <laughs> Ambrosius Aurelianus asks, uh, so how do others remember it? A wrong, apparently. <laughs> um, uh, well, here's the question I'm asking myself. Remember to write as it was told of old. By whom? By whom? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, who told him? From whom did Elrond hear this story in the old days? Maglor? 
Maglor was a very important figure in uh, young Elrond's life. Um, the whole Stockholm Syndrome thing. Um, he could have heard it from his father. Um, yes, yes. Um, or his mother, also possible. Um, yeah, Eärendil, Elwing. I mean, they would have told it, the story, presumably. I mean, the the you know when he was still growing up uh, in the you know refugee city in the Bay of Balar, he would have. The, you know, the, the, the refugees from Fallen Doriath were there, right? So presumably he would have, he would have heard it there. Um, uh, Brunier says, is, is this suggesting that elves don't have perfect memories? Well, yeah, I don't know that we need to think elves have perfect memories. Um, but uh, again, I don't think that, I don't want to, I don't want to go too far here um i don't think that this means everybody else gets this story wrong like every other version of this story is 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 messed up right i don't think he's saying that other elves you know get the details of this story wrong that isn't the point i think the point is he says remember it aright as it was told of old i think it's the telling right that elrond can repeat the telling as it was originally told by people who were eyewitnesses of part of it, right? That is very rare uh, for other elves who are still around for you to hear it from, right? Um, very, very few of the elves that they're going to ever meet were there and could hear eyewitness testimony, could hear the story told. But again, I don't think it's about, like, getting the details right. I think it's about hearing the telling. That's why I said Maglor at first, even though Maglor, as the son of Feanor, uh, wasn't directly involved in any kind of flattering way. Yet, nevertheless, I could easily imagine Maglor, the great, you know, one of the great uh, of all the Elvish musicians, um, doing a pretty good version of this story. Um so, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Kate says maybe the implication is that the version told by the Numenorean exiles was imperfect. Um, yes, that seems very, that seems very, um, very, very possible. Um, yeah. Uh, Kyle's wondering if Galadriel could tell this story. Yeah. Where was Galadriel? I don't think she was there. Um, I mean, she would have known Melian. She would have known Luthien. But uh, I'm not really sure where. I don't think that she would have any, you know. I, I would think this story would be pretty secondhand to Galadriel. But who knows exactly where Galadriel was at what point. Um I say that, of course, because all that is sort of retconned by Tolkien later, and he never decided on the definitive answer to those questions. Uh, Go Galadriel and Celeborn are not a glimmer in Tolkien's eye at this point. Galadriel emerges for the first time when they get to Lothlorien, when the, when the Fellowship gets to Lothlorien, and there's this elf queen, and then she turns out to be kind of a big deal, and the character of Goadriel is born. Goadriel is not an original character from the Silmarillion. She does not get integrated into the Silmarillion until after he drafts the Lord of the Rings. Um, so she's a, she's a latecomer, big time latecomer, to the Silmarillion picture. And he went back and forth, as we s talked about in the um, Unfinished Tales, yes, Unfinished Tales uh, class that I did ages ago, back in, what was it, 2013? Early 2014, maybe? Um, uh, in the Mythgard Academy, uh, you can see in the Galadriel and Celeborn section of Unfinished Tales how he was, I would say waffling. No, it's not waffling. As he was, like, thinking and rethinking and reconsidering options uh, for how that story was going to go. Um, yeah. Uh, Pontine Gorfindel wasn't there. 
Gorfindel was dead at the time, um, so Gorfindel definitely uh, uh, definitely wasn't around. He was in Gondolin uh, during the whole Baron and Luthien thing, and then he died, so he never even met the... You know, it's all... It's all... Um, so, yeah, Gorfindel would have no angle on this. And uh, Kyrdan. I guess Gorfindel might have met Luthien after death, right? Maybe maybe Gorfindel heard her song. That'd be cool, right? I mean, he could be an eyewitness testimony to that. Be like, oh, yeah, I heard her, you know, come before Mandos and sing her song, and it was pretty awesome. Maybe Gorfindel heard that. I never thought about that before. But um, uh, anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, Lincoln, that does explain why Goadriel is such an incidental character in the published Silmarillion. Yes, she's barely ever mentioned. And those mentions, Christopher Tolkien had to go back and squeeze in, in following, and he was very gentle about that. Tolkien never wrote it in, right? He had several ideas for the role that, that Goadriel was going to play when he was going to insert her into the Silmarillion story, but he never wrote them. And Christopher, in his editorial role, is always very, very cautious about actually writing stuff that his dad didn't write. Um, much more comfortable choosing um, between uh, uh, choosing between texts that his father wrote and things, and sometimes he has to make hard choices, but very rarely does he just go in and compose stuff. He does, it happens on some occasions when he's kind of forced to, but uh, but yeah, that's why there's so little of Goadriel in the published Silmarillion, because uh, uh, Tolkien himself wrote so little of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I know that Gorfindel is alive, uh, that the fall of Gondolin is after Baron and Luthien, but he was in Gondolin, like, with no contact with the outside world. So they would have heard, maybe, rumors of the fact that Baron and Luthien existed, but he wouldn't have any angle on their story. He'd never met them, right? Um, and uh, didn't know them at all and and would have heard about it long after the fact. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, oh, oh, right, right, yeah, he wouldn't be in the halls of Mandos yet. Yeah, that's true. See, here I was trying to get an eyewitness to the, but you're right, he would still have been alive in Gondolin at the time that she was in Mandos. You're right, he couldn't have heard that. Oh, well. See, triumphal here. I was trying to. I was. I, I. I wanted to get an eyewitness to that. That would be cool. But no, no. You're right. You're right. She predeceases him, and then, what? Both times, actually. Right? She. She predeceases him twice, which is pretty tricky. Yeah. No. Good call. You're absolutely right about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. Well, see, darn it, Trifle, that's what always happens, you know, when beautiful, lovely theories are confronted with facts. <sighs> oh, well. Not always, I guess. But too often. Too often. Oh, well. Okay. Strider's going to start to chant softly. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about this poem. And we are almost at the end of our time, so this is what we're going to do. This is this is this is what we're going to do. As I said, this is my favorite poem. This is my favorite of Tolkien's poems. Period. Um, there are two poems in this book uh, that I'm going to want to spend some significant time on. Um, one is this poem, and the other is the Errantry poem, uh, Bilbo's song in Rivendell. Um, and uh, um, I. Uh, um, oh, thank you, Kate and Matthew, for trying to preserve my theory. You are absolutely right that, of course, we're told that the Song of Luthien is still sung imperishably over in Valinor. So Gorfindel would know it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. He would He would totally know it. Um, but, um, uh, but, but, yeah. Anyway, okay. Okay. Um, with this poem, you'll notice, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about the other poems, but I haven't done a whole lot of, uh, like, let's look at all the earlier versions and stuff. You know, when, I, when we were doing our Return of the Shadow class, we looked at no fewer than, what do we look at, five versions of the All That Is, uh, uh, all that is Gold Is Not Glitter poem? Um, 
I think looking at sort of the 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 ideas of that the development of that poem and that was really fun. But I don't want to I don't want to bog us down with looking at the 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 development of every single. We're not going to read um, like four different versions of the troll poem, though at least four versions of it exist. Um, however, these two poems I think are really important. I really want to understand them because they. These poems are so much cooler uh, when you get sort of the full context of where they're coming from and sort of what they mean uh, in Tolkien's world. They, the development of these two poems uh, tells a really fascinating story uh, of sort of how Tolkien wrote and how his stories emerged, uh, which I think is sufficiently fun that it's worth the time to tell. So we're going to do that. Um, so there's no way, no way that uh, we're going to get through the poem even next class. It's not going to We're going to spend more than one class on this poem, I'm almost sure. But here's what I want to... Um, um, uh, here's, here's what I want to uh, 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 do tonight. Tonight I'm just going to read it. I'm going to read the poem through. Then next time we will start off talking with this one. I don't want to start with the earlier versions of the poem. I'm going to start with this one. Because the first thing I want to do is make sure that we're looking at this poem and the significance that it has for this moment, right? Um, so uh, thinking about the relevance of this poem to Strider the Teller, to the Hobbits, that he has specifically said, Sam has requested a tale about the elves before the fading time. Um, he would dearly like to hear more about elves because the dark seems to press round so close. Uh, notice that Mary's impulse is an understandable impulse and maybe a very similar kind of impulse, right? Gilgal had sounded kind of awesome, right? So could you tell us more of that story? Um, yet Sam really sees to the heart of the thing, right? What we need here, Mr. Strider, is a tale about the elves before the fading time. Right. The dark is pressing around us. Um, uh, you're trying to keep our hearts from fear. You know what would really do the trick? A tale about the elves before the fading time. Right. So in responding to that, um, in responding to that, Strider tells the tale of Tenuviel. So I want to think about it in that context first. So we're going to we're going to we're going to first look at the poem as it's published in The Lord of the Rings. Then we're going to go back and look at the history of it a little bit. Um, so that we can kind of better appreciate how it got to the place uh, where it is. Um, but first, let's just read it. And I'm going to read it straight through. And your job, and we're not going to discuss it in full tonight. Your job is just to think this through. Think about this. Read it carefully. Uh, think about this song in the context in which it's introduced. Right. And we will uh, discuss it next week. The leaves were long, the grass was green, the hemlock umbles tall and fair, and in the glade a light was seen of stars in shadow shimmering. Tinuviel was dancing there to music of a pipe unseen, and light of stars was in her hair and in her raiment glimmering. There Baron came from mountains cold, and lost he wandered under leaves, and where the elven river rolled he walked alone and sorrowing. He peered between the hemlock leaves and saw in wonder flowers of gold upon her mantles and her sleeves and her hair like shadow following. Enchantment healed his weary feet that over hills were doomed to roam and forth he hastened, strong and fleet, and grasped at moonbeams glistening. Through woven woods and elven home she lightly fled on dancing feet and left him lonely still to roam in the silent forest listening. He heard there oft the flying sound of feet as light as linden leaves or music welling underground in hidden hollows quavering. Now withered lay the hemlock sheaves, and one by one with sighing sound, whispering fell the beechen leaves in the wintry woodland wavering. He sought her ever, wandering far, where leaves of years were thickly strewn, by light of moon and ray of star, in frosty heavens shivering. Her mantle glinted in the moon, as on a hilltop high and far she danced, and at her feet was strewn a mist of silver quivering. 
When winter passed, she came again, and her song unleashed the sudden spring, like rising lark and falling rain, and melting water bubbling. He saw the elven flowers spring about her feet, and healed again, he longed by her to dance and sing upon the grass untroubling. Again she fled, but swift he came, Tenuviel, Tenuviel, he called her by her elvish name, and there she halted listening. One moment stood she, and a spell his voice laid on her. Baron came, and doom fell on Tenuviel, that in his arms lay glistening. As Baron looked into her eyes, within the shadows of her hair, the trembling starlight of the skies, he saw their mirrored shimmering. Tenuviel, the elven fair, immortal maiden elven wise, about him cast her shadowy hair, and arms like silver glimmering. Long was the way that fate them bore, o'er stony mountains cold and gray, through halls of iron and darkling door, and woods of nightshade morrowless. The sundering seas between them lay, and yet at last they met once more, and long ago they passed away, in the forest singing sorrowless. Okay. Whew! such a good poem oh man um okay so um this is uh uh it is such a beautiful poem isn't it Carita? um yeah uh so let's um we'll talk about this next time things to focus on as always right listen to it right listen to the rhythm and the shape of this poem um this is tolkien doing his uh, Tolkien's versification at some of its greatest, right? Tolkien loves to play with uh, rhyme schemes and structures, right? And the shapes of, of, of words and the shapes of poems. Um, think about that, right? The rhyme scheme of this poem is one of the most intricate that he ever wrote, and it's extremely successful uh, here, and he does some really cool things with it. Uh, look at the overall shapes of the stanzas, and not just the individual shapes of the stanzas, but how it goes, the overall trends that we can see throughout the whole poem. Like, for instance... What makes the last stanza different from all the other stanzas, right? How does Tolkien break the shape? Um, uh, how does Tolkien break the shape of the poem in this, or deviate from that shape in the last stanza, right? Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. Um, so lots of um, lots of stuff to think about here. Uh, as I said, we're going to start off with a close reading of this poem as we get it, and then I want to look back at its history and thinking about it is, I don't know, in some ways it is so appropriate uh, when you see that that sentence, I will tell you the tale of Tenuviel, right? And then he comes out with this poem. It is so, like, of course it's the tale of Tenuvio, right? Of course it's the tale of Tenuvio, because what we'll see when we look at the history of this, the very interesting history of this poem, it's not just that the Baron and Luthien story was Tolkien's favorite story, which it clearly was, right? It's not just that this story meant more to him uh, in lots of ways, artistically, personally, and everything else, right? It's not just that. Um, it is that... Uh, the way this is the story that always not only this is a story about breaking boundaries right it's about uh, 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 release from bondage um, but, which is of course the title of it the lay of Lathian um, before but it's also this story itself kept breaking boundaries this poem uh, kept forcing its way through uh, for Tolkien time and time again and we see it happening uh, here uh, in the Lord of the Rings. This is sort of the culminating moment of the Baron and Luthien story itself breaking boundaries uh, and releasing things from prison. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, Tarloniel says that sorrowless is my favorite word in the whole poem. Um, yes, that last line is amazing in the forest singing sorrowless. Uh, so good. Um, okay. But I'm going to stop there. I'm going to exercise extreme self-discipline and not start the close interpretation of the poem tonight uh, because 
it is very long and we don't have time for that and i'm not going to rush this uh so next week we are going to talk about this poem the whole time and like i said i'm not even promise promising we're going to get through talking about this poem in one week um it's going to be uh uh it's going to be a lot of fun so we're going to do this next week and then we're gonna um uh and then we're gonna uh that, and then we're going to come back. So, okay. So thanks everybody. I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter as I always do. And we're going to switch over. It's going to be, it's field trip time. Uh, so thanks for joining us this week. I was going to say bye. You can join us on Twitch, which is working now. Twitch.tv slash Signum uh, So thanks very much, everybody. Okay. And good stuff. There we go. Good. All right. And now we're going to switch over. All right. Woohoo. Let's see. Okay. And I think we have. Uh... Good evening, everyone. There we go, Valari. How are you? I am doing fine. Missed everybody. All right. Yes. Yes. We missed you last week too. Last week was, was last week. Last week was our Europe friendly week, right? Last week was the Europe friendly one. Right. And uh, right. yes, that's really generally right. when I'm helping people with homework and making dinner. So that was really hard this week. But yes. Maybe, yeah. well, maybe I'll is, be able to make some of them. It is tricky. Yes. I've, <laughs> I've been invited to do an Australia friendly time. Uh, but as, oh the su- my. as the suggested Australian friendly time was 6.30 a.m. Eastern, I, I oh, don't... see, that one I can do. No, <laughs> Everyone's on the no, bus at 6.30. I, I, <laughs> I'll I just can't. go solo. I'll just, may, I'll just you know. <laughs> even, apart, even apart from the fact that I am, shall we say, not at my broadcasting, uh, you know, peak performance level at 630 in the morning. Well, I who mean, is? <laughs> in fact, if I, I, there are some people like that. I mean, there are some, you know, there's some people who spring out of bed uh, and mm-hmm. are all cheerful and talkative, bless them. But uh, that is not I. Uh, and I'm, <laughs> as my, as my uh, uh, children will attest, I usually barely can, you know, grunt uh, at 630 in the morning. But in addition, <laughs> it's, purely impossible even apart from the fact that uh it's undesirable uh because i it would conflict with me driving my kids to school so oh right yeah. no, okay mine have the bus so no you could just put the, the pictures up and just go Muh. yeah exactly Muh. yeah I, I, it, it's all the slides yeah i would just have to point at things and grunt take long um, sips of your coffee and glare <laughs> evil into the camera <laughs> It's more moaning, really, even than grunting, you know, like the, yeah, yeah, it's just, I'm sorry, I am not a morning person. Uh, there was a time in my life when I aspired to be a morning person. I tried to convince myself I could become a morning person, but I just, I've given up. Um, That's when you're allowed to sleep from 11 till 3 in the day, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. All anyway, right. so let us, um, uh, let us... Uh, let's head out. We're going to go back to the Lone Land. So last week, so here we can we can run while I'm talking about it. So last week, um, we spent all of our field trip on Weathertop again, looking around the countryside. So it was a sort of a remote field trip as we were mm-hmm. uh, uh, sort of looking at the land from a distance. And the main thing uh, that I was focused on there. Uh, is looking at the overall shape of things, trying to figure out, because of course, all of the talk uh, from the um, uh, from the text, uh, right about uh, you know the 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 battles and um, you know Weathertop's position as a military fortification, and mm-hmm. uh, you know the sort of the the you know the li- you know the the line of the road coming down from the North being screened from the, you know, all the ways that that kind of invites us to think about, um, you know, what was the military position around Weathertop, you know, and, and uh, I mean, all this stuff and, and the Lotro developers rarely even need that much provocation to be thinking in those terms as we've seen, Um, you know, they do a lot more thinking even than the books 
invite explicitly in thinking about what would these lands, which, you know, how would the history of these lands be visually represented? You know, what kind of evidence of the old days, Mm -hmm. all the ruins and stuff, of course, that we've spent so much time looking at. Um, I guarantee they go over those descriptions about as thoroughly as we do. And again, oh, absolutely. Yeah. If not more. Yeah. You can see, you can see that. So um, anyway, knowing that they're going to be thinking about that and and even seeing the evidence that we've seen, like when you do come down that road from the north uh, towards Weathertop, you see that they have in fact carefully designed uh, the layout of the land so that uh, you can't, um, you can't see Weathertop from the road, right? You know, they do in fact Mm -hmm. have it screened by hills and by uh, standing stones and things. So um, anyway, um, oh, I see it's night time again. That's fine because we had our view from Weathertop. So when I was looking at fr- out from Weathertop, we were noticing several different ruins, right? Um, yeah. And looking at the ruins from Weathertop, I was trying to figure out where exactly were the battle lines. And my theory from the view from Weathertop, my theory was that the east-west road served as a boundary. We know that the Arthedanian kingdom didn't extend much further than Weathertop. Um, but, yes. but my suspicion was that we're going to find that all of those uh, ruined fortresses south of the road um, are Arthedanian, and the ones on the north side of the road are Rudaurin. And so Rudaurin. in particular, that big fortress that is just under... Uh, Rivendell, the one that's closest to Rivendell on the northern side. Um, I think mm-hmm. we're going to find that that uh, is Rudaurin, that that represents the sort of, you know, uh, frontier camp, as it were, of the Rudaurins who were trying to, att- you know, that, that was the base of operations for the Rudaurins who were trying to attack Weathertop, essentially. Hmm. Um, okay. That's my, that's my theory. And, uh, and I think we will see um, and I'm, by the way, I'm really, I'm not just, uh, I'm not just dogging this here. Like I haven't like scurried around with my other alts to confirm this. I literally don't know. Uh, so uh, we know you do not have that kind of time. I, yeah, I don't have that <laughs> kind of time. Exactly. So, uh, so I have done no confirmation of this guess since I made it last week. Uh, well, that so, makes it more fun. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we'll see. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, cause I'm thinking that the, um, the the fortresses we know already from the one that we looked at from Minas Ariel, we know that that kind of crazy paranoid uh, fortress was a uh, uh, seemed to be Arthedanian. We didn't see any Rudaran symbols uh, in that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so now to see, so the one I want to start with. So we're gonna tonight. We're gonna continue. Yes, we are on uh, Landerval. Uh, yes. Uh, anyone who wants to join us can jump ahead. Um, if you want to come, we're going to be at the Forsaken Inn here in just a, uh, about a minute. There's Weathertop we can see now off in the distance. Um, we're also going to be, if you wanted to go, um, I mean, if you have already travel in this area and want to go to Oscar Ruth and come backwards and meet us from there, that'd be the fastest way to get there if you're yes. uh, fully travel capable. We're taking the scenic. I think route the other here. one is you could go to Saradan's hut, and if you need, if you have the quest, that'll take you directly to Candace encampment. That, that is would true. Work too. That would also work. Yes, though I'm going to resist the temptation to go up on Weathertop, especially, and my resistance of that temptation is made easier by the fact that it's nighttime. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the way, as I'm as we're riding here towards the Forsaken Inn, looking at the silhouette of that tower on the right. Oh, yeah. Uh, which now comes into view. It's no longer a silhouette. Um, right under the bowman. Yeah, right under the bowman. Exactly. Uh, is that part of Minas Ariel? It is, isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. I think so. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's the path that goes up to Minas Ariel. Yeah. Okay. And what was this, by the way? We never really looked at this. I don't think we did. There wasn't much to it other than columns. No, there's not. Again, we and, see yeah. standard Arnorian symbols all around. Scepter of Anuminus, you know, stars of the 
Uh, Looks like this was a more... circle around this natural rock over here. Yeah. It just seemed this big old rock was enclosed by, what, a gigantic gazebo? Is that what this is? Maybe. The gazebo of kings with that strange rock outcropping at the in the middle of it? How this rock is mine. Yeah. My rock. Is there some history to this rock? Would it be an important rock for some reason? Hard to imagine what was important about this rock. I don't know. Does it bear inspection? I don't know, but that really does. The ruins do kind of go around it in a circle, don't they? I mean, there's some yeah. other random things, like this one up here, up the hill there, uh -huh. but... Yeah, if we go around... It, it's not even flat on one side. It's completely insurmountable. Yeah, oh, can... not completely. Okay, here you, I am. Oh, you, I'm on top. Right, you, you can climb up it. Okay. Yep. Uh... King of the hill, ma. Okay. See, but these columns were very tall. It clearly could have held a, a ceiling which would have gone over that rock. Mm hmm Huh. Hmm. Intriguing. No idea. Very intriguing. <laughs> Earthquake? I don't know. <laughs> That, that is a big question. It's like, did anything drastically change in this area? You mean... I mean, like, like well, like this river is completely gone. Yeah, this right. river is completely dried out. Right. Presumably there was a river there at some point. Um, in in fact, we know there was a river there in the Arnorian time, right? Because they built a bridge over it. Yeah. Which they wouldn't have bothered to do had it already been dried up. Um, yes. Yeah. Are there any other drastic changes that happened here? Hard to say. Like maybe this was part of a rock fall. Right. Maybe, but I don't know. A little hard to imagine that that enormous rock got like tumbled down the hill and just crashed into the mid into the like the dead center of the ancient gazebo. Well, I mean, conceivable, I suppose, but it seems unlikely. Fourth it's Thomas improbable, Captain, it could but not impossible. Improbable, but not impossible. Fourth Thomas was wondering if it could be where Elendo and Gilgalad first met. That kind of a historical marker is kind of what it sort hmm. of looks like. Hard to believe, hard to imagine what role that big, enormous boulder would have played in that. I mean, would Elendo have climbed up onto it, you know, and been like waving down at Gilgalad as he came by? I don't know. Various rocks have had a surprising amount of history in this world. It's true. It's true. Um, yeah, the other thing they don't address is what if this was a failed construction attempt? You mean like the, started, the gazebo? Right? Yeah, like what if they had started I thought the you were going to move the boulder. Through. Oh, man. No, I, yeah. I wanted to use the boulder. That is literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We're not right. finishing this. Right, I see. Or, quite possible. Now, JJ is absolutely right. It is too bad that we don't have... If Merlin were around, we would have letters of gold carved on the rock to explain exactly why it was there and <laughs> why they yeah. built a gazebo there. Um, it is really too bad we don't get that. Um, JJ is wondering also if it could be a siege weapon that smashed through the gazebo. Uh, perhaps uh, you know a boulder hur hurled by a giant among giants. Um, it wasn't really a boulder. It was more of a hill. <laughs> it really is more of a hill. It would have been an enormous, a truly enormous siege weapon. Any siege weapon that could hurl a boulder that size would presumably be taking aim at something larger and more significant than a gazebo. Um, yes. Anyway, okay, so here we are, and we've got a ruin off to the south, which uh -huh. I'm getting, even from this distance, a nice Arthedanian feel from this. So that's that's encouraging. Yep. And then we turn to the north, the northern one that I want to look at first, because this was my theory that this is Rudaran. So let's see. I know it's occupied by unfriendly folks these days. So we might need to dismount and help shield some... Oh, right, yeah. If any, do we have, have low-level folks here? I don't. Uh, yes, at least so. one, because we've got people aggroing on somebody, so. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, oh, who's your daddy? There it is. First column. <laughs> oh, the Rudaran crown. 
Oh, it's so good to be right. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Woohoo. Okay. Whew. Oh, Are you doing a little dance in your office I, chair? I am. I am. Uh, this is me trying and failing not to be smug. So, let's see. <laughs> Woohoo. And they've got, the, oh, look at that. Just as big as you please. The Rudaran oh, yeah. is everywhere here. Oh, boy. This is the most Rudaran ruin we've seen. Um, still very much in the style. Right? Ooh. Look at the I three like kings up the top up there. Yep. Who did we say that? No, it was the when we had the five, we were thinking it was Isildur and his four sons, right? Yes. But the three kings... Ah, that's really interesting. Let's see if we can get up and, and take a closer look at them. Look at the proximity to um, to Weathertop here, right? You can see how this is this would have been right under Weathertop. This would have been... Uh, but, of course, it would have been difficult to... Although they could have lobbed stuff down on it from Weathertop. Um, that's a surmount. That's a pretty big distance. <laughs> it is. A, it is a fair distance. And uh, I mean, it's not like they were firing, you know, a large cannon or something that would travel for miles. Um, no, I don't think so. And uh, it, it's an interesting little sort of fortification. On the one hand, I mean, it's low, right? You know, you can't exactly build a castle right next to uh, uh, weather top and hope to get the high ground right and yet no. it is on a little rise right so you have to first you have to come down this wall um, so it's it's at the bottom of a wall instead of the top of a wall which is a little unorthodox but can work right um, and well, but it's it, protected it, exactly it's protected and it's built up on this little mound here right so and it's presenting a pretty solid front here you can see that this is you know designed to you know, withstand assault from this direction. So, you know, clearly it is it is presenting an unfriendly face here uh, to uh, to Weathertop. Um, so that makes sense. And yeah, you know, here we have several different terraces, right? So you've got that that you know those stairs being made of stone makes it a little bit easy to assault. But you've got to go all the way around multiple levels. Look at all the different kind of choke points and. You'd have to fight your way up four different staircases. I'd still myself have erected a gate of some kind, but still, uh -huh. um, you know. And then before you finally get up here, you have that tower there. You can't jump up here, right? I think I always wanted to, but I couldn't. Um, okay. And this, yeah, is where, no. it, it, this, this is where the boss is, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what I remembered. Hauntimers. 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 Yeah. Sounds like Ooh. Pontifer. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And the ground here shows interesting evidence of old paving stones that have been overgrown. Oh, you yeah. see the wines. Can't really see what was on them. Because there's the star here. Right? Yeah, there's right under my feet here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, all overgrown now. But you can see that this was, in fact, a paved. Well, that's a heck of a respawn. Yeah, he respawns every, what, 20 seconds there? Yeah. I actually have vague memories of that when I was questing through here. I seem to remember that but was one of the bosses that I fought three or four times because. <laughs> Got a henchman stuck on depots. Ah. Uh, oh, well. Oh, man. Okay. Oh, and yeah, here I they like are. How, here are the kings. I like how the coloring here... The, the coloring of the stone is much darker and purpler. Yes. Yeah, so you can see that even just from a distance, that it's made of a different stone than the other ruins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and here are the three kings. We've seen these guys in several places, in the Breelands. Mm -hmm. We saw them. Didn't we see them in the? Yeah, we did see them in the Barrow Downs, didn't we? Yeah. Yes, we saw them in the Barrow Downs. I th think we saw them up and uh, yeah, that that paranoid place we went up to. Mm -hmm. Minas Ariel, yeah. Yeah, Minas Ariel. Thank yeah. You. The paranoid palace. Yes, exactly. Um. Which means then that we've officially seen them in uh, 
we've officially seen them in f- three like di- places which are definitely Rudauran, um, Arthedanian, and uh, Cardo. What did we decide? Cardo Cardolan. Cartilangian. That's right. That's what we decided. Ah, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Semi arbitrarily. Actually, no, just not arbitrarily, but because it's funny. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so. Legendous. Yes. Uh, so, th- uh, anyway, we've seen this in all three places, which suggests that these are probably old Arnorian kings, like like as it might be Isildur, Anarian, and Oendil. Um, mm-hmm. But. Um, I still am interested that there's no differentiation of any kind. The three images seem to be identical. And equal. And equal. Status yes. height. Exactly. Height in particular, right? Which you wouldn't necessarily expect if one of them is a Lendl. You'd expect the one in this. As we do see, in fact. Yep. Uh, in, like we saw in when we, Yeah, in the high elf. Well, also, when, remember, we met him in per- person in the oh, high elf. Yes. They were not joking. Exactly, yes. When we, when like we, it says on the tin, he was a tall drink of water. <laughs> he was, a Lendl the tall. Uh, and no two ways about that. Yep, agreed. Um, oh, but there's another guy. There's a solo down on the next arch. Oh. That's really interesting. Doesn't seem to be anyone diff- any different art style it's yeah. the same image who how many stars does he have above his head oh i can't really see one two three four five i think it's seven i think he's got the seven uh, stars so did these gentlemen back here yeah which would of course prove that it's uh you know dunedine not that we needed much more evidence of that but Mm-hmm. Oh, not that that's any surprise, that is to say. But they are the only... These dudes are the only decorations that are not either this, the crown of, you know, the forest crown of Rudaur or the... Um, what's it called? Scepter of Anuminus. Yeah. We did see yeah. the scepter in places. Though it's not always where you expect it, like it's not on the. Usually, that's up on the keystone, and yeah. it's not always on the keystone. I think. Oh, you're right. It's not this time. They put the crown places, everywhere. But yeah, down in, down on the ground level, by where we came in. Oh, look at this up here. They put them. Oh, they're just the crowns everywhere. Oh, they stuck it on the tower too. Yeah, yeah. Like little chess biscuits. Exactly. Chess biscuits is exactly what I was thinking about when I see those little Lutheran things. I'm hungry. <laughs> I know. It's staying up late, does it? <laughs> okay, and I've got to think that here these, the the flagstones here are what was obscured in the tower. Oh yeah, definitely. There, you can see it's still kind of grass grown. Yeah. But, which explains uh, why we could make out a design because most of them don't have a design. Yeah, most of them are just bricks put in either uh, sort of crisscross hatching pattern. Yeah, yeah, and then of course the major stars. Yeah. In in knitting, we call that a basket weave. I don't know what it is in bricklaying. <laughs> <laughs> Man, look at those huge. Look at that. You know what? Where would you see that? These huge Rudaran symbols. Do you see what I'm looking at? If you if you, if you come up here and then you look straight down. Oh. Uh. Let me see. The biggest Rudauran symbols in the whole castle. Oh my goodness. Look at those things. They're like 10 feet across. You know what I think those are for? You know where you'd see those. Right? You'd see where? those from Weathertop. Oh. <laughs> if you look down from Weathertop, you'd be looking right down on this castle. And you'd be yeah, like, I suppose the next step up is to just, you know, paint the whole thing in gasoline on your lawn <laughs> right. and set fire to it. Yeah, big honking Rudauran symbols in your face if you're looking your down face. from Weathertop. That's hilarious. But again, it does make me wonder, where's the scepter? Usually he was always bragging about the scepter, about going to get the scepter. He deserves the scepter. Yeah. We saw that in the statue. We saw that in the architecture. How come the scepter's completely missing this time? Well, I thought I saw some down on the ground floor, but I'm not seeing any up here. Yeah. Yeah, there's... Oh, 
I'm trying to see if I could see the top of that tower, but I don't think I can see it. Can't get the angle right. Okay. Oh. I see it has an, oh, art, it has an artichoke. Is that the same three there. king on the top of those two towers over there? With the archway in between? Um, you're, you're facing right at it, I yeah, think. Yeah, there's one on each side. Yeah, is that the same image? I think so. Yes, looks like it. Oh, and then there's the three up above on the wall here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they put the... And the I think that's the one place. we saw from the bottom. Yeah, it is weird. They just look like they've been stuck on like a cake decoration. Yeah, the stone is even different. Yeah. Brought over from the motherland. Perhaps so. It's a little bit odd. Oh, this stone's different here. And there's more of them over here. And more huge rudar and symbols on the floor. Yeah. Bigger than the stars. Well, he's probably considered himself more important than the stars. Yeah, what? Why is that stone different? It's weird. Well, and why is that? The, I, I'm trying to I don't recall the these king images I don't recall them being stuck up on the top of things everywhere like this like they were usually like against walls or like set into walls you know yeah built into walls yeah, yeah. freestanding I've never seen before and they're everywhere they're like on top like I mean I think in Minas Ariel we saw something kind of like that but it's like almost every tower. no it was it was along the side of the tower yeah right that's where we saw the five kings along the side of the tower mm -hmm. yeah it's just it seems like uh it's like everywhere you go those sort of warrior kings are looking down on you and it's a little odd we're supporting a, <laughs> a battle that <laughs> Uh -huh. And see, so this, what, tower slash... Oh, man, this, this had the biggest picture the of biggest, all. biggest, yes, the biggest Rudaran crown of all. Um, Although I don't think you can see it from Weathertop. I can't see it at the summit of Weathertop over here. Nope. Oh, you're right. <laughs> nice try, Rudar. It's not for the benefit of, of Weathertop. Oh, look at this. It was too... Oh, oh, look at all the leaf pattern around here. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. I'm trying to figure out the multiple layer thing. This looks like it was. Uh, maybe it was an arc like the stuff we've seen in the Midgewater Marshes. The sort of rounded amphitheater. Right. And this like looks like it, some sort of capstone that fell over. But no, there's columns set in it. Never mind. It's probably just a rounded dais or. Maybe it was meant to have a step there. Like. Yeah. Interesting. What, built over another? Like, they made one big, huge. Uh... I think that's just a texture map snap. <laughs> well, maybe. Oh, look over here. Look, scepters. Found them. I knew there were some down here. Oh, here we go. Back in the keystones. Yeah, the little keystones. Yep. Yes. So when we have this kind of. Uh, you know, like arcade action here. We're getting the scepters. With the leaf and the vine. Oh, oh, oh I, yeah, the leaf yeah. and the vine. Which yeah. we still have never figured out. No, we never did. Other than it just being a favorite little architectural detail of, you know, I bet all of these mm -hmm. have scepters. Yes, they do. No, the top ones do. See, so when they have the the wall built among them. Right. Um, they don't put it, but when they have the freestanding columns with the arches in between, they have it. Mm -hmm. We can see that in both stories going up there. Okay. Yes. Right. Oh, so maybe this was actually supposed to be a platform that was higher up and it collapsed down on this big platform. Yeah, I think that I think it I think it did collapse and break. I'm going with that, too. This is probably a very multi-tiered thing, like the 
terrace over there you know the three yeah, we can yeah. see the three different levels and stuff this was meant to be really grand so notice that that suggests right a really interesting kind of uh, uh kind of combination right where you have mm -hmm. on the one hand um designed to be a military fortification uh in yes. case you know those chumps from arthodyne up on weathertop decide to attack them um and yet inside of it we have them because this area looks like one big sort of architectural fancy set piece you know sort of a rotunda shaped tower kind of yeah thing. like the exactly some kind of huge covered dais trifle exactly um maybe it's like that one in the um north downs where it started out as a luxury palace and then they built on additions that made it military notice the stuff right. that's military is the stuff that's headed more towards weathertop and that's where we lose some of these elements like the scepter and stuff like that Right, so yeah, it, perhaps, uh, right. Oh, that's interesting. So maybe this came first and it was not quite as militarily designed, but right. later and on. And then they threw up the fortifications afterwards, yes. Mm -hmm. After the, the war really began in earnest. Yeah, I can buy that. That seems like it would work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ugh, these guys. Yeah, because then we get down here and we have. Oh, this is obviously more ruinous, but look at this hill, like you know, this really steep hill for you know, up to the main entrance over here. Mm -hmm. Would have been really easy to defend, even though there's high ground on the far side there. What's this up here? A little separate little ziggurat action. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, just another high, pretty place for looking down at things. Or up at things. Great view of Weathertop from here. And the main road. Yeah, true enough. Good view of the main road. Very good view of the but main it's, road. But it's not a scout sort of place. No, it looks yeah, like a, totally a leisurely not. place where you'd sit and just, you know, people watch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Rue Dower and people watchers. Kind of like yeah, that. Bring me a latte to the South Tower. I'm going to people <laughs> watch the main road. Possibly. Possibly. Oh, so Forthalus was saying he had a brainwave the other day. Maybe the seven stars are meant to refer to the sickle of the Valar. Um, possibly. Possibly. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I could see that. That um, sickle over there in the sky. <laughs> yes. The uh, sickle of the Valar is bright tonight. Or this is Menelvigor with his shining belt, which is not the sickle mm -hmm. of Valar, actually. Where would the sickle of Valar be? No, sickle of Valar is over this. Up uh, north. The, yeah, here uh, it is. There it is. Yeah, north, up there. There's the sickle of the Valar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's a theory. It's a theory, especially interesting um, with the. Uh, sort of the Arnorian, you know, sort of both for Arnor and Gondor, really, the sort of the vigilance theme against the enemy mm -hmm. would seem to work. I think it looks like an upside down bear with a long tail, <sighs> said no one ever. <laughs> I'm not, hang on, I've just gotten down brick tails. Um, do they, do they have a binary star? In the Dipper? Mm. No, I'm wanting to look. I don't think so. I don't think it's a binary in, in Lotro. Or maybe we're just failing the Roman eye test. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. No, I, I don't see the binary. Uh, I think it'd be less of an eye re test and more of a low resolution thing, but. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. they don't have the binary star. No, the binary star. Army nerd. Yeah. No, I was pretty sure. I didn't see Interesting. That. Why yeah. is that? I love the stars. I do wish the stars moved. Yeah, me too. That's one thing I would love to see. All right, what time is it? I think we still have a little uh, bit of time. Yeah. 
I can't imagine an engine would be able to do that without crashing, though. <laughs> it's just so much up there. Most yeah. of the stars actually do move. Uh, it's just only the the canonical constellations uh, yes. of the Plow and uh, Orion and whatnot do not. Yeah. I, uh, someone mentioned that they were in the same position that they would be over Oxford. Is that... I believe that is correct, yes. I always like how uh, Menelvagor with his shining belt is right above the eastern horizon, which is right where he is when all the elves burst out singing in Woodhall, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it kind of sort of remembers that moment from the story when Menelvagor becomes a thing. So, okay. So testing out part two of my theory that this is Arthodyne Ruins, not Radar. Arthodyne Ruins, and I'm... Oop, green sky. Uh oh, yeah, it's getting it's getting sinister around here. Whose banners are these, though? These are lovely banners. <laughs> what is it? Uh, Two hands? The... Two fists? Dower okay. hand. That's the dower hands. Right. Oh, I see that it's two hands and it almost looks like a warhammer. Yes. That is clever. That is clever. Yeah, two fists with a crown above it. Okay. What kind of crown? Let me see. Little, is it a little, a little tiny one? Yeah. That is a teeny weeny little crown. Interesting. It's more of a tiara than a crown. That's not <laughs> like what you'd picture for, like, you know, a big old Durin kind of crown. Right. Yep. I'm definitely, we're getting stars where we would be getting crowns. I think yeah. I'm right again. Yeah, the sky is just overcast right in that spot, apparently. Well, this is an evil place because there's stuff going on on the hill up there. Uh, this hill that we're going towards here? No, the, the hill uh, facing uh, due west. Oh, okay. If you get a little closer, you can see some of the lights of the evil rituals taking place. Ah, I see. Right. <coughs> We've missed the primary evil there. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, I think... If we go through the uh, the dwarf, the underground stuff that the dwarf leads us to, we can get up on the hill. Right. Thunderbell. Okay, so this is a test. So this looks like a watchtower. Yes. This would have been a watchtower. Totally Arthurian. So okay. So this is not a significant outpost, though. That is more significant. Uh, and then that over there. Oh yes. That is Oscar Ruth, right? Which we could not see from Weathertop. We couldn't see Oscar Ruth nope. from Weathertop, right? So looking over here. I think those hills would have been in the way. Yes, yes, yes. Those hills were indeed in the way. We could not see Oscar Ruth. We could see this ruin that's due east of us here. Uh, so far, Oscar Ruth is more well protected than in, than Estel did. <laughs> yes, yes. It is a slightly better kept secret than Estel did, but that's not saying very much. Oh uh, man, you should come here at night when it's uh, when it's a low low visibility day. <laughs> right. It looks like you're walking on the road with a flashlight. I cannot find that city. <laughs> okay, here, let's see. I want to I go up in the hills here. Alright. I want to see the... I want to see the... The ruins up here. More dower hand banners. Yep. Let's see. Okay. Up this canyon and then we throw up a wall across it with a nice gate. Oh, this would have been... Oh, this is a much easier way to get up here. How did I think of that? Easy to defend and totally Arthedanian. Absolutely. Yes, I'd have to agree with oh, you there. Mithranost. Okay, so this... 
Wow, boy, and then you come in here Silver. and you're just, like, killing someone Silver. here. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah, this, this is a great place to get shot at by invisible archers. Yeah. Then you come out into this courtyard where, again, holy cow, think of, like, the ranks and upon ranks of archers that could be shooting down yeah. from all directions. And just stars and stars everywhere. Stars of Numenor all over the place. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, I'm just looking oh, at... Oh, look at the ceiling! The ceiling yeah, looks I was just amazing. looking at the ceiling, yeah. That's pretty cool. The design in the very center. Very center. It's kind of open. And you don't have the mm. same textured stone. It just looks like dark patches. Uh, I think that's uh, just a that's a coincidence of the four patterns lining up, it might the be. standing in the corner forming an image. Might be. It, well, I do like it. I appreciate how the, it's different than the floor too. It's its own thing. Yes, though reminiscent of the floor that was overgrown. You can see the similarities yes in this floor too you can see and the similarities the um yeah. between this and the architecture at the rudauran one right um this is the very this is a very similar floor pattern to the one that we saw overgrown with grass mm -hmm. in the other uh in the other fortress um, also interesting that on each uh segment of the tile uh there's only six stars instead of seven no yeah. Huh. If we're taking each uh, half oval as a its own pattern. Oh, right. Then there are either 12 or 6 in each version. Right, right. Up in the ceiling, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay, I want to see what we... What's up the door? Oh. Uh oh, looks like sketchy activity up here, of course. Oh, Sketchy no. activity. We've got hanging cages with skeletons. We've got Lich white pins. factories. Yeah. Oh, they put the this, this skeleton cages all along the walls and everything. Oh, this is awful. It seems it's very vile activity for dwarves. We don't usually see these sort of things in dwarf buildings, do we? Yeah, I really hate what they've done with the place here. <laughs> Oh man, and then we change to the red and green. Oh, with a goblin <laughs> altar. Oh no, no. Goblin no. altar. Yeah, that's. Are there even but, goblins uh, here? I don't know. I don't think I've seen a goblin out here. Why are we invoking seen... the great goblin here? I know there's orcs in this building and there's dwarves in this building. Weird. Yeah, especially since they generally don't team up very well. Yeah, now of course we can't see anything because we're in the middle of like terrible. Oh, I do know you can fall off this, by the way. So. Okay, I will be careful. What I'm doing is, um, I'm just looking out. So I'm staring straight north here. So Weathertop is there. Okay. So there's Weathertop, which I can just see the silhouette against against the horrible <laughs> yeah. cloudy sky. And straight north would be to. Your straightish north would look across the valley with the road in it towards Rivendell, I think. Well, no, towards uh, what? What is it? Last, the, that Rudaran um, place. Was, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking further east. Yeah, because if we, I'm just kind of so. So again, I'm trying to think of the. Oh man, we got blue torches here yeah. too. That's really not good. And then just like unburied corpses lying in piles. Uh, yeah. Not good at all, but you know, this part of the fortress has a pretty good view out. So this is a great stronghold that they've built up. And I've got to think that this probably happens so we get um, the Arthedanian stuff kind of encroaching down, you know, that we get... Um, Down, I mean, from 
from Weathertop. The, see, the thing about this, about this being an Arth... Oh, can I open the door? Yes, I can. Um, think about this being an Arthurdanian stronghold, which... It, oh, wait, no, this just takes me underground or something. Yes, it does. Unless you want to take a look at the runes in there. Uh, well, tempting may do, but... <laughs> Well, Let's go back to the gallery of death. Yeah, because I'm wanting to find the... Yes, this is what I wanted. I'm wanting to find the way out. Where am I pointing? Oh, no. This is not the way. This is the way we came in. Yes. No, 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 no. That's not what I want. Oh, the I'm way thinking. out is on through underground. Yeah. So there's no... Hmm. It's a perfect little mouse trap. Yeah. Or we could jump off the side of the cliff. Okay, so this See, just that. takes you up to the white place. Uh huh. Okay. okay. So then this area would have been the one that overlooked off to the north, which was essentially towards the Rudauran frontier. Yeah, from okay. here you could look at the road, you can look at the Rudauran activity, and you could signal weather top if you had yes, to. Yes, easily signal weather top um not minus aerial because there are hills in between right uh -huh. um and yes the uh the lauren span we should head to the warren span too to go back yes. to minus aerial too so let's see which way is that if we go this way yes right. i believe we so need to head off to the west here Because, of course, when you're, you want both of your fortresses to be uh, defensible, but, of course, you want them to communicate with each other. You give them a nice narrow bridge. Yes. So neither one, if either one falls, the bridge is easily defensible from the other side. Why is there I'm this little sure mini gatehouse thing? That's probably a guard post. Yeah, maybe. I mean, a portcullis would be. Well, it also there. it's also convenient to limit, you know, bottlenecking your enemies and making sure they can mm. only walk so many abroad. I ask, does it go down? I think it might be functional too. <laughs> Guard spiders. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the sort of wedding cake style oh, pillars no. they had down there which is very interesting yeah you can see them better over here oh they do look like wedding cakes yeah they do and i'm hungry again yeah i think the the gate post actually is up right on top of those columns so there might be some function to it as well interesting i mean mm -hmm. more function other than uh just forming a defensible point in the middle of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, they're using the rock. They're not building this wall around a boulder and hoping for the best. Right. Right. And then that's weather top right there, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then this is what leads then straight back around to Minas Ariel where we came from before. Yeah, Minas Ariel over here. Okay. Cool. Well, I am very excited to have my theory so triumphantly confirmed. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, a sufficiently unusual experience that I'm quite savoring it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Okay. So yes. And here's Minas Ariel where we, this is where we stopped when we came out of Minas Ariel before in this little camp with all the quest givers. out at weather top again okay cool all right well we will continue next time we'll continue exploring uh down towards oscar ruth uh and uh and further to see from the look of it it looks like oscar ruth would have been rudauran also and then that one across the way down on the south side so that the theory i was hatching last week from the top of weather top saying that the road served as a kind of frontier um between 
the lands of the uh, Arthurdanians and of the Rudarans. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if that continues to be borne out. But I should say good night to folks. It's not hideously late yet, so I should probably stop while I'm ahead. Hooray! Uh, but <laughs> thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us. And um, we will be back next week for more poetry discussion and then uh, more exploration of the Lone Lands as we continue and to Crick get Hollow. our mental map set up. Yes, on the Crick Hollow server next time. So, very good. So thanks, everybody, and I will see you guys next week. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.